It's time for the Splash Live from Civic Center TV, featuring stories from and about people like you in the greater West Bloomfield area. Simulcast on cable, 89.3 Lakes FM, social media, and the web. Now live from Green Media Center on Walnut Lake Road, it's the Splash Live! Live local social, it's the Splash Live on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. Thank you so much for joining us after a very long Labor Day weekend. I'm your host, Kevin McIntosh, and joined today by my colleague and co-worker, Jake Schaff. How are you doing today, Jake? I'm doing great, Kevin. Glad to be here in the studio and glad to be back here after a great long weekend. It was great to have the day off. Glad to spend some time with some family, mm -hmm. eat some great food. But we're back to work today and lots of stories to get into. Can't wait. Correct, correct. And per usual, we have some big shoes to fill with Tyler Keith being out. But getting straight into it, this weekend saw the unofficial start to the fall season, Jake. Absolutely. I had the privilege of attending the grand opening of the Franklin Cider Mill this past Saturday, and I had the chance to speak with a lot of the visitors and to get their thoughts on this on the cider mill opening up for the season, getting to taste that food, getting to start to breathe in that fall air, even though it's still technically summer. And I also had the chance to speak with the owner of the cider mill, Melanie Peltz Radner, who we had on the show fairly recently. And I got to hear her thoughts on what this anticipation has been like leading up to this exciting event. Well, the anticipation by myself and my employees and our whole team here and all the community is just wonderful. Everyone cannot wait for it to open. The phone calls, the emails, and we're just all excited to finally be here and ready to open. What have been some of the most popular items, would you say, so far? Well, because of the beautiful hot day, they always want their cold um, slush, and then they get the cold cider to come home. But always hot donuts is a must. Everybody wants to get their hot donuts. They love their apple pies, our caramel apples. We have four different varieties now. We brought back candy apples this year, so now we have candy. And we have our caramel apples with or without nuts and our double Godiva chocolate nuts. So it's just insane. It's great. It's really nice for me. It like kind of marks the start of fall, um, but also like I've been here with my family so often, so it's just tradition. I try to come here, um, you know, a couple times a year as much as I can. So. Oh no, it's great. Uh, I only moved to Michigan about a, a year or so ago. I moved in with her. I originally was in Massachusetts, and she's brought me uh, every week or two weeks in the fall. We come here on the weekend to come get uh, cider and donuts. It's always so fun. Yeah. How long have you been coming to the Franklin Cider Mill? Oh, as long as I can remember, probably uh, 35, 40 years. Bigger crowds, um, they've gotten a little bit more uh, things to do, different, uh, different foods, different entertainment to come back. So uh, it's been nice to see, but it, it hasn't changed its core values and it, you know, its core simplicity, I guess you could say. The, the food, the people. Uh, if you can come out and it's it's a beautiful day like this, you know, you've got the little river here, you've got the little music in the background, good food, you can watch them make the cider. It's just something that you, you kind of remember what it was like when you were 15 and I was here, you know, or 17 or whenever I came uh, my first time. So it's always been a nice tradition and it makes you feel like you're a kid again. What would you say about this place really helps draw in the customers? Um, I think, uh, you know, for me it's tradition, right? So, like, my parents were coming here as kids, and so to come back and, you know, remember all the years my parents had here, um, I think that's what keeps me coming back personally. It's, it's like my family's tradition now, so I really enjoy that. Oh, yeah. No, the, the atmosphere is so nice, and there's something here for everybody. Like, you look around, you can see people of, like, all different age groups and backgrounds and everything because all the different shops and vendors and products you can buy and just uh, the comfortable atmosphere. The staff are always so nice and friendly. Like, I just feel like it's, it's a fun place to be. There's, a, there's always something you could do or, or uh, find that's interesting. Once the cider mill opens up for the season, that's when you know that fall is truly in the air. And just from being out there, Kevin, there was so much to see. I had some of the food. I tried their donuts. I tried their cider. I even tried one of the cider dogs. All of it delicious. And it's the kind of place where you kind of have to visit it multiple times a year just to fully appreciate everything there is. I'm certainly going to be making another visit, and I, I hope that you will as well. Excuse me. Yes, that's a great way to kind of start things off going into the fall season. Like we said, technically still in the summer, but we all know we're in the tail end of the summer. So kind of getting things going as Michiganders, hitting that local cider mill is the best thing to do. So great interview. Great topic again, Jake. Uh, as we kind of go into 
more good news stories locally that happened. A Kego Harbor resident actually got his wish to meet a superstar. Kego Harbor teenager and 10th grader at West Bloomfield High School, Stanley Sakulik. He actually had a memorable reason for missing his first day of classes. He met his idol, Eminem. Yes, rapper Eminem met Stanley, who was diagnosed with Duchenne muscular uh, dystrophy, excuse me, at the age of six. If you're watching on civiccentertv.com, you can see the photo of Stanley along with Eminem and some loved ones right there. He had his wish granted through the Make a Wish Foundation. So he actually had a, a chance to meet a local idol and a superstar. The Kego Harbor team spent 15 minutes with the rap star Eminem at his mom's spaghetti restaurant in downtown Detroit, by the way. Stanley's father expressed immense gratification for the ex uh, experience, calling it a once in a lifetime moment for his son. I understand 100% also being a fan of hip hop it would definitely be a wish, but Stanley well-deserved, and I, I, I'm even happy for him myself, Jake, to be able to meet his own idol. Absolutely. It, it truly is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, as you said, and I can only mm -hmm. imagine what it's going to be like when he come, when Stanley comes back to school, because a lot of people say, oh, I had to miss school because I was sick, I was on vacation, yep. there was <laughs> something with the family, but it's not every day you hear somebody say, oh, I had to miss school because I had to go meet Eminem. That is incredible. <laughs> and th that that's one of those memories that Stanley is going to cherish forever. I'm, I'm so happy for him. Yep, yep. He has the evidence all over the internet. He has the evidence right here on Civic Center TV. And he also has the evidence all over social media. So nice, Absolutely. nice again, uh, Stanley, for meeting Eminem. And speaking of social media, staying aware of social media's impact is actually the goal of a local organization that's thrown on an event for it's the Be Happy and Healthy panel for parents and teens. They'll actually be discussing and taking place, uh, excuse me, that could be taking place at West Bloomfield High School. This will be on Wednesday, September 18th, 7 p.m. The panel discussion is open for both parents and teens. They want to get all perspectives involved, and it's going to dive into mental health issues and how factors like social media can play a huge impact on mental health, especially on our teens and just parents and everyone in general involved. This event is sponsored by Henry Ford Health and the Greater West Bloomfield Community Coalition. I think this is very, very uh, a great, impactful event that we're hosting right here in our local area, especially at the high school where, you know, teens and, and cell phones are prevalent, you know, and, and, and it's starting to become more of like a, a topic as we start the school years off, Jake, as whether or not cell phones sh should be allowed and social media being a big part of cell phones. So I think this is a great uh, event that we need to get more of the people out in the community to attend. I couldn't agree more. Social media is very popular, especially with the high school aged crowd. And there's benefits to this, but of course there's also cons. Social media can be a very rough place at times and it's always important to make sure that the kids mental health is good and secure and that everyone's okay yeah. so yeah i think this is going to be a great event at the at the high school coming yeah. up yes absolutely once again wednesday september 18th west bloomfield high school 7 p.m for more information, uh, that'll be the date and time. We'll have more information as we continue on also. But West Bloomfield Lakers, speaking of West Bloomfield High School, actually kicked off their football season last week with a massive victory over Chippewa Valley. And while you and I actually took Labor Day off, the Lakers were back on the practice field getting ready. And our very own Tyler Keith took a moment to review week one with Coach Hilbers after the L boys got to a 1-0 start. I'm Tyler Keith alongside head coach Zach Hilbers on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. The Lakers coming off an emphatic win in week one, 42 to nothing. Your initial thoughts on that first performance against Chippewa Valley? Uh, I mean, it's always good to win week one, and you feel really good, I guess, when it goes down the way it went down. Uh, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it rarely is in high school football, so we're, we're really happy with how the year started. We just hope to, you know, we uh, kind of keep our focus going forward. 
What were some of the key points that you were impressed with the, with your team, especially defensively with, with your team coming out and making plays really from the jump against yeah. a tough offense? Yeah, that was the best part to me was like we were ready from snap one and uh, obviously Corey made a really big play to start the game off, which was huge for us. And we kind of made a few mistakes after there on all phases of the game, but we kind of like kept our composure, stuck to like our stuff. And as soon as our offense found its footing, you know, they started to move the ball and score too. What do you think was the difference maker in, in kind of finding that footing after those early stumbles? Well, it really was, we had a bad snap on a drive, which killed, I think it was a second and short, all of a sudden became a third and long. And then we had a penalties on the other drive. So any drive that game where we didn't have a bad snap or a penalty, we scored. So as soon as we kind of, I guess, got those jitters out of the way, we, like I said, stayed in it and trusted it and did okay. That was something that was really interesting about this matchup this year and this week one for the Lakers is it didn't seem like those preseason jitter, jitters, those early season jitters, took as big of a toll on that team. Is that something that you noticed as well from the coaching staff side? Uh, yeah, I would say so. And a lot of it is because we made it just a play or two. You know, sometimes if you make a mistake, you can let it kind of spiral and it affects a series or a quarter. Uh, we made a mistake on a couple play here, a play there, and we kind of moved on and did the job after it. And you, you can get away with a lot more if you have that mentality. Especially on the defensive side of the ball, coming into this season, we looked at the youth of this team and it was kind of a 50-50. Is, mm -hmm. is this going to hit in week one or early on or are we gonna see some growing pains? It looked like these young defenders were really well prepared and came out and executed. How impressed were you with the younger players coming up on that defense, especially in the secondary and their performance in week one? Yeah, I was really happy with it, like you said, because, you know, Chippewa Valley's got some athletes. they got some really good receivers out there, and uh, we were able to kind of execute our game plan, and they, they look they look pretty good. You know, mistake here or there, but that, that, like I said, that's going to happen. It's our job to coach them up and get better from there. Um, you know, the challenge this coming week is going to be a lot different um, and really physical team that's going to try to hit you in the mouth, so we just got to be ready for a different style of football. We saw your team be really confident after that 42-0 game and even throughout that game, which is great for early on in the season, but like you said, it doesn't get any easier from no. here. So how do you keep the team focused at, as they're going through that 42 nothing blowout win in week one and then as you refocus them after that, celebrating the win but keeping focused on the, on the eight weeks ahead? Yeah, it's something we talk about all the time as a team that, you know, life's like this and football's like this. It has peaks and valleys and ebbs and flows, you know, but it's our job to be like this. Um, so when things are going really, really well, like it did for us last week, um, it's our job to stay level headed and, you know, be ready to, uh, to prepare the next week and play the next game. And then, you know, the other side of that is when things aren't going your way is like, can you have the mentality and I guess the fortitude to fight yourself through it? So, you know, we've talked about it a lot, but at the same time, we got to we got to do it, too. Jeremiah Benson on that defensive line, he was an absolute bulldog in that, in that game. That goes yeah. for everybody else. Tank, Travis, the whole group yeah. in that defensive core. Uh, you looked at that as being a critical part of this team this, this season, especially on the defensive side. How impressed were you with their performance, these upperclassmen coming in and really a tough act to follow after the D-line you had last year? Yeah, it's uh, you don't really find too many Brandon Davis Swains. I've nah. seen one in my years here. Um, so it's a tough act to follow, like you said. But we knew Jeremiah was really good, and we don't, we don't need him to be Brandon. We need him to be himself. And uh, he did a really good job of that because he can be – a very, very good player. You know, um, when he reaches his full potential, you know, it's going to almost feel like we didn't have a drop off. And I never would have thought after a guy like Brandon leaves, you could say that. But Jeremiah can be a very, very good player. On the offensive side, very similar story for Joshua Tate, who a year ago kind of had that, those expectations of being that next great Laker running back. Didn't quite have the season statistically you would have thought he would have, but you know, did all the little things really well. He comes yeah. in to week one this week. Primary ball handler in the backfield, two touchdowns. How impressed were you? How, how proud were you of him to have a game like that and get that off his back? And I, I was probably of the kids in the team I was the happiest for. It'd be like Josh and Jamal Shakespeare, yeah. who like put in a ton of work. They're really good kids. I mean, Josh, Josh does so many little things right um, in the school day and, and for our football program and for our team. So to see him. You know, kind of reap the benefits of that. It's it's really why you get into stuff like this, coaching and teaching and stuff. It's he's the type of kid you, you would root for if you know who he is. So like, I'm really really happy for him that he got that success. Coach, before we take a break here, your key takeaways from Week One, what you're looking to see improved from that Chippewa Valley game onto this road game coming up in Birmingham. Well, we kind of mentioned it, but um, you know we 
be excited, be really happy because you saw like the process worked and when we went and executed our game plan the way we wanted to. But we talk about it all the time is that, you know, highlights are good for a team, but mistakes are what really win and lose games. So if you have too many mistakes, you're going to lose. And if you eliminate your mistakes, you got a chance to win. So I guess that'd be our really our biggest sticking point. And you can watch this entire episode of This Week in Laker Football all on our social media, Civic, or our website directly first, civiccentertv.com. And, of course, you can watch it on our Facebook at Civic Center TV 15 and YouTube Civic Center TV also. Just to make it easier, we have the QR code on the screen. Take your smartphone, scan it, and it'll take you to the links directly to our social medias where you can keep up with everything that we have going on in the Greater West Bloomfield. Speaking of, we have a lot more to keep you updated that you should be aware of that may impact our community. But we'll get into that because we are live, local, social. It's the Splash Live on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. We'll be right back with the Splash Live. Find local municipal meetings at our program schedule on civiccentertv.com. Find when your meetings air live or when they're replaying on our Civic Center TV live stream. Find it all at civiccentertv.com and click schedule at the top of the screen. Good nutrition can help make sure you have enough iron, calcium, and vitamin C in your body, which can make it harder for lead to enter your bloodstream. Help protect your family from the harmful effects of lead. Last week, Brandon met a girl on a dating app. One day after work, he finally found the courage to ask her out. No answer. He started to panic. Was he being too pushy? Maybe it was too... Hey. Sorry, I didn't respond. I was driving. I would love to go on a date. How does tonight sound? Brandon tried to play it cool, but inside he knew. A girl so smart, so responsible. She must be a keeper. I'm Greg Flynn, the fire chief here in West Bloomfield. Congratulations, Civic Center TV, on your one million views on YouTube. Together we share the message of community safety and preparedness making West Bloomfield a safe and wonderful place to live. My name's Greg Flynn, and I'm proud to be one in a million. And now, back to the splash, live. Live local social, it's the splash live on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes F. Lakes FM. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Kevin McIntosh. Now, at the recent West Bloomfield Township uh, uh, Town Hall meeting, there was a discussion about a local West Bloomfield culvert and the construction possibly going on with that. That could affect local lakes and water areas, including Green Lake. And actually here to join us to talk a little bit more about it just to, prov to provide the facts uh, from the Green Lakes Association, but representing himself, we want to welcome Paul Benson to the Splash. Thank you for being here, Mr. Benson. Thank you, Kevin. So uh, I know we have a lot to consume uh, with so little time, but I want to give you the platform to essentially give an overview, first and foremost, of the discussion with the covert and Green Lake and, and everything that could possibly affect the community. Uh, basically, there's a retention pond or pond that is adjacent to Green Lake. It has always retained the, the stormwater uh, of the 17 residents that live around this pond. Recently, a dam that was built uh, attached to a bike path has been removed and the um, Road Commission's project is not considering the elevation of where that dam was. So it's dropping the water level um, over a foot, if not 20 inches to uh, that, and it's causing issues with our water quality and sending high qualities, uh, high volumes of uh, total phosphorus from fertilizers that go into that pond now is being drained continuously into Green Lake. You can see that some of the photos mm. that you posted, the huge algae blooms that came directly from the, this pond then flows into our lake is causing a massive overflow at the inlet uh, that 
that you see there in this photo behind me, this is the algae bloom that's created uh, that from that pond that of all the nutrients that are coming into our lake from that pond. We uh, uh, talked to the township and talked to the will commission about uh, you know, putting that dam at an elevation that's a safe elevation. We had tests done uh -huh. of the pond and it is actually almost four times what the township ordinances allow to be drained to another water course. So this water has to be contained. It is not legal to come to our lake. And that's why we're addressing the okay. township to say, you have to consider this a contaminant. And that's how you define it as a contaminant. And that's what we want. You know, there's solutions that we could do with the township and the residents there. Right. Because when that dam did exist, it held the water higher mm -hmm. elevations when they got fresh rain, rain water. They were able to dilute uh -huh. the high nutrient count in the pond, helping their environmental impact and e ecosystem mm -hmm. in the pond itself. And yet we would only get the water in extreme rain events. And uh, right now right. we are not, we're getting it on a constant flow. The, uh, the pond is not gonna be healthier as a result. And our lake is gonna take a negative impact because of it. We were asking the township to uh, contain that water and uh, get it back to how it was. And that's basically so summing I want it up. You to and, and I and we do appreciate that with us like right here live on the splash uh, uh, resident in West Bloomfield president and also president of Green Lake Association but representing himself Mr. Paul Benson talking a little bit about the covert the uh, Roe County Commission of Oakland County's work on this covert and how it can affect possibly uh, uh, this uh, green green lake and the water storm off and how it is currently affecting i should say with the uh evidence that we have so you you mentioned something about an ordinance that this is that's supporting um what you're talking about can you go a little bit more into the township ordinance that you're you're talking about a little bit please well, well basically the township ordinance has a water criteria uh checklist or or a chart that uh, has okay. a total phosphorus uh level that is allowed to be passed to another uh, water course or floodplain or stream or river mm -hmm. and that uh, elevation or le level is a 0 0.05 milligrams per liter right now our test has indicated uh, that the pond right now is at 0 0.18 milligrams per liter so almost mm -hmm. four times what is allowed to be passed to another water course and um, this is where we're asking the township to immediately, you know, contain that water until proper solutions can be help, uh, resolved to fix and get that pond water to a, a, um, a level that is safe to be passed to the rest of the watershed. Um, and, and, you know, basically with the Road Commission, you know, the ordinances mm -hmm. require that everything has to have a full compliance to all the ordinances for the road commission to even start digging, you know, and that this is where we're uh, asking the, the uh, township to, you know, we have to follow all the ordinances. Those are the things that protect our environment. And we don't, we don't let our residents, we don't, we have to follow them. That's just the bottom line, you know, and if you follow them, 100%. our health of our ecosystems will be better. And the road I commission, completely understand uh, that. Yeah. No, please continue. Uh, the the uh, the World Commission, you know, they I talked with Andrew Peters. He was the head guy that was I was communicating with at the uh, World Commission, mm -hmm. and he he basically said that the World Commission doesn't do uh, water quality, so they'll address the engineering aspects of it, but they don't deal with what's in the water and what is being drained. I then okay. called. And, and, I, okay, I then called uh, Eagle because they said, "Well, we had to get an Eagle permit for this uh, construction project." And I talked right. with uh, Eagle Part Three Hundred One, but that's the transportation division of Eagle. It is not the water quality division. So really, there is with the Road Commission and Eagle, there has been no one from Water Quality uh, Division a part of this project. 
Fortunately for us, and, the and, township has uh, strict no. ordinances on water quality. Right. Right. And, and 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 we appreciate your perspective in providing those facts in regards to that uh, uh, to that side of the story. But we, we as we kind of wrap up, uh, Mr. Benson, I do want to kind of overall for our listeners and our watchers and our local residents who may be affected by this may or may not. What is the overall message that you want them to kind of take away from this, from watching or listening to this? Well, we've known it for a long time that uh, heavy fertil fertilizing your yards that go down to a lake or stream is, is detrimental to the health of that body of water. And the residents okay. on this pond, they don't swim in the pond. It's a lagoon that uh, they don't use it for gotcha. recreational. It's just a, a storm water retaining pond for the fertilizer and they all fertilize. Mm. I walked the other day, there was five fertilizer signs out on their yards. Um, so it is, uh, it is just their place to have all the fertilizer run into it. And then now it, it appears that it's gonna be running into our lake. And uh, right. we, we don't, uh, I think the fertilizing is what is the whole project. If they clean the water and get it to a state that is below the criteria of the township's ordinances, then there's no problem. But as of right now, it's mm -hmm. four times as high as it's allowed to drain to our lake. And, th and th that's why it has to stop. And we right, don't want right. to and, and we we thank you for, the rest of the, for ultimately. Yeah, yeah no. we don't want to go affect ahead. the rest of the Huron River watershed. We're a headwater of the Huron River right. watershed, which we're gonna go to lake to lake to lake. And to have a five acre lagoon be a contaminant pond that we're going to allow to just go all the way through the Huron River. Uh, you know, it's going to impact, uh, have a negative impact on all the fish population, the habitats that you have. It's it, it's never ending. Yes. You know, it's like we're supposed yes. to be stewards of our environment and, and leave it better than we uh, came with it. You know, and right now, this and, and that's why we have you here to prevent the facts in regards to that that side of the story, Mr. Benson. But we okay. definitely have to wrap up and we do appreciate your time. And I definitely do appreciate all your evidence. Once again, president of the Green Lakes Association, but representing himself right here on the splash, talking about Green Lakes and the uh, culvert in West Bloomfield, how it affects the uh, community and water runoff. Paul Benson, thank you again for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Absolutely. So a very important information that he presented to the town hall at the town hall meeting, Jake. But once again, there's another side to the story as to why certain things are going on. Overall, we just want to prevent, I mean, present both of the facts, both sides of the stories. We will try to get another perspective on it. But overall, Jake, it's just good that we're able to uh, provide that platform for people to understand these types of things that are going on in the community. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Lots of great information that Paul provided. Great to hear this side of the art of, of everything. And th this kind of stuff is it's never easy, Kevin. It's it's always a lot of work to, to yeah. make this stuff work, but it's necessary work to make everything else work smoothly. Absolutely. But as we continue to keep our community updated on things going on, we're talking about celebration, a 50th anniversary for the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society open house event on September 8th. They will be holding a special open house to celebrate 50 years and offering a extra special look into our local history, highlighting the last 50 years and beyond. So here to tell us more about it is museum and communications assistant for the greater west bloomfield historical society anna smith thank you so much for joining us yeah good morning thanks for having me yeah so uh we're we're talking about 50 years celebrating can you just tell us about this event overall and what we can expect Absolutely. And you're 100% right. This really is going to feel like a celebration. Um, you know, GWBH mm -hmm. has tons of events coming up this fall that we're sort of going to delve deeper into the history of the Historical Society mm -hmm. and what we've accomplished. But uh, this upcoming Sunday, 1 to 4 p.m. at the Orchard Lake Museum is going to feel more like a party. Um, and we have lots of fun activities planned. It's going to be a great family friendly event. Um, there will be things to do outside the museum and inside the museum. So rain or shine will be here. We have uh, our yes. lawn 
Yes. yes, we'll have our historic doctor's carriage out. People can take photos there. It's a great photo opportunity, really fun to see groups come over and pose with the carriage. Um, on top of that, you know, in, in terms of the celebration aspect, we plan to have a, sort of a 70s staple, I've been told. It's an ice cream float. Um, they'll be made with Verner's. Oh. Fago, which are our Michigan staples, obviously they're Michigan products, um, and we'll have cupcakes as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're really just sort of taking a look at uh, the 50 years that we've been here, but also it's going to be kind of like a time capsule. Uh, so we'll have these multi-level looks at what the world as well as uh, the United States, Michigan, and then also West Bloomfield, what all of these places looked like in 1974 and kind of what was happening during that year uh, on each of these levels. So it's going to be a really fun event. I know, right? A lot to look forward to with that being said too, Anna. So I wanna kind of ask, how do you feel like the organization itself, the Greater West, Bloom Hill, Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society has evolved over those 50 years? Absolutely. Um, I will say that one thing that's been consistent over 50 years, though many things have changed, is that, um, you know, this historical mm. society really got started because a group of citizens uh, thought that it was very important to preserve the history and sort of the natural beauty of, uh, at first, just Orchard Lake Village uh, in 1974, but then by 78, we had sort of expanded uh, to cover the four areas that we serve today. Um, so people really show passion for the history of this area, which I think is fantastic. And the way that we've sort of evolved over time to continue to spark interest in history as well as preserve it is um, we've really moved to sort of an online format, um, whether that be sort of making aspects of our collection available online for the public to view for free, which you can see on our website. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we also have ongoing projects such as our Collecting Memories project. We usually do a theme uh, for each month of the year where we ask uh, citizens to submit their stories to us about memories they have, whether it be about, uh, we had vintage cars in August. For September, our theme will be Memories of School. Uh, people can go online and they can submit their stories to us, any photos or videos they have, just memories of our four communities and an exciting front on the collecting memories project is we actually now have sort of a generic collecting memories form on our website uh, and we are encouraging people to come and submit any memories they have about their time yeah. in our four communities and, and i'm glad you brought that up and uh and that's a great way to put it too also i just just to reset the show Join us right here live on the Splash Museum and Communications Assistant for the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society, Anna Smith, talking about the 50th anniversary celebration on September 8th, Sunday, 1 to 4 p.m., uh, Orchard Lake Museum. I also want for you to talk about how the local community and residents plays a role in uh, preserving local history. Can you just talk about the impact and the importance of that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, history is being made through residents of this community right now. And this historical society mm -hmm, wouldn't mm -hmm. run without our residents. Um, we are completely volunteer run. So we require sort of that input and that help from the community, from residents who are interested in preserving our history, but also pulling in other people and uh, getting them interested as well to see what these communities looked like and what they continue to look like. You know, history is being made um, every day. So a lot of our new information, and we find out new things about the history of these places, I mean, all the mm -hmm. time. It's still happening now. And a lot of times that information comes to us from residents who have a memory that they share, and it sort of sparks this, this story or this lead that we follow, and we find out something new. We had, um, we had a parent come in when we were doing uh, our Apple Island field trips for the second graders this past May, um, came in and saw one of our sports and recreation exhibits, and we have sort of a highlight of different Olympians who have come from West Bloomfield, and he actually informed informed us that, oh, well, there is another Olympian from West Bloomfield who I don't see in your exhibit. So it's things like that. We're constantly finding out new things about our community and about history. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I love that. And that's the that's the point of it, too. Like, we are all residents of the living history of West Bloomfield, Greater West Bloomfield, Orchard Lake, Kego Harbor, Sylvan Lake. So it's it's all right. It's, you know, it's, it's our job to kind of preserve different things and, you know, help turn it in and make it part of history and make it part of the museum so it can tell the story of everything that happened. I, and I love that you explained it just as beautifully like that. So uh, I want to kind of talk about... Uh, ultimately the this uh mapping local history project can you just talk about the significance of updating the uh the map uh, and historical sites of the area yeah absolutely if you think about it uh the first historic sites map that gwbhs did was back in 1975 so that's the year after the society actually formed and that's even before we sort of expanded out to cover um, all four communities that we serve. It was just Orchard Lake Village back then. Um, so updating that, you know, 50 years later, a lot has happened in the past 50 years. We've seen a lot of changes, a lot of um, different buildings that now mm -hmm. have significance that they didn't I mean, even just a few years ago, things have changed so quickly. Um, so that presentation is really going to be fantastic to see just how much the community has changed over the 50 years, but then also how much of it has stayed the same. A lot of the sites that you see on the original map from 75 will also be on our 2024 map and we'll be highlighting those changes as well as we'll have um, free copies of the maps to give out to people who come to the presentation so they'll be able to look side by side and see for themselves how it's changed. Nice, nice. And with us right here live on the Splash Museum and Communications Assistant, for the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society, Anna Smith, talking about the 50th anniversary open house event on September 8th, Sunday, uh, where we will be talking about great history right here locally in our area. So just looking forward, uh, just in general with the uh, Historical Society, what are some of the future goals and projects Greater uh, West Bloomfield Historical Society has planned? That's a great question. Yeah, we are always looking for the best way and also new ways to preserve and also present the history of our communities to the public. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of great programs coming up just for our 50th anniversary. You mentioned our mapping local history presentation where we'll talk about our historic sites maps. Um, in November, people will be able to see a presentation where we go through the 50 year timeline of GWBHS and highlight our activities and our accomplishments as a society. Um, going forward, I think it will be important for GWBHS to um, sort of reach out to the community. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of resources for us to keep going, and it also takes uh, the public's interest in history for us to keep going. Um, so whether that be with, with programs we'll do or partnering with uh, different organizations in the community, you know, the school district, for example, we do our Apple Island field trips with them, um, but even just being able to sort of get in the classroom and, and be able to present history to students um, is, is a very important thing, but it's also important to reach out to the yeah. public in general and bring them in and get them in and see what we're doing here. And then, you know, once they're involved and they're interested, uh, then we have more people to play a hand. You know, maybe someone has a, a special interest, you know, that they know a lot about. They can do a presentation and, you know, the broader community can learn more about a certain topic. It's uh, things like that. You know, we really want to focus on um, outreach going forward and how we can get the public interested in local history. Yeah. And we're happy to be a part of that channel to help get that word out there for the community that actually help uh, the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society and all of their projects and their goals going forward. We definitely appreciate you again for joining us, Anna. Lastly, just a, as we wrap up, give out the details, any and key, any key information regarding the uh, September 8th, 50th anniversary open house again. Yes, absolutely. Um, this Sunday, September 8th, at the Orchard Lake Museum, we're on the corner of Orchard Lake and Long Lake, uh, 1 to 4 p.m., rain mm -hmm. or shine. It's going to feel like a massive party, and there's tons of fun activities to do. It's going to be great for the whole family. Um, 
you know, for example, kids who came, second graders who did our Apple Island field trips in May, may remember uh, certain things they did at the museum, like the farm chores obstacle course or ringing the old green school bell, things like that. Um, it'll be a lot of fun yeah. for everyone who comes here. Oh, exciting, exciting, exciting. Thank you again so much for giving us all of that information. Once again, Museum and Communications Assistant for the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society, Anna Smith. Thank you again. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Great talk. Great. And I love just talking about that. That's something, Jake, that we, we really need to talk about just in general, just preserving local history, family history. Like it takes all of us as we literally live our lives to start preserving and saving different things and coming together as a community so that we can all see that as we grow up through different generations. I think that's a great thing, celebrating 50 years also at the same time, Jake. Absolutely. I mean, history is super important, no matter what kind it is. I mean, everyone only gets one life, Kevin, and everyone wants to be remembered mm -hmm. in their own way. And it's things like these with the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society honoring these people or these events or everything that's occurred in local history and over the last 50 years. So this is going to be amazing, Kevin. I, I, I can't wait to see it. No, absolutely. A, a, a lot going on. Like, we like to keep the community updated. That's going on. And speaking of a celebration over the weekend, the Friendship Circle of Michigan's annual Walk for Friendship event took place. So many families actually came out over the weekend to support the Friendship Circle and help raise awareness for those with special needs. And actually with us right here live on the splash to tell us more about this past weekend is the Friendship Circle's executive assistant to the director, Julie Newcomb, joining us this morning. Thank you for being here, Julie. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, so a great, great turnout, or at least that from my perspective, but overall from your perspective, how would you say this past weekend went? I think it was wildly successful. I'm so happy to see so many members of our community come together for such a wonderful celebration of everything that we do. Now, as far as the overall goal, uh, at least financially and everything, how has everything been? Have we reached our goal and things of that nature? How has that turned out? Well, this year we set a very ambitious goal of $1 million. It was our first year to set a mm -hmm. goal that size. Uh, we have not hit it. Mm. However, we did get a last minute sponsor that came in that just put us over $900,000. So that'll show us up on the website pretty Ooh. soon. And then we are still accepting donations for a while afterwards. And last year we did about an additional 40,000 after the walk. So please keep those donations coming in at walkforfriendship.com. That's the number four, walkforfriendship.com absolutely absolutely and, and and can you also just talk about the impact that that type of uh fundraising makes for uh uh the friendship circle just talk about how that actually directly impacts we have over 40 programs that friendship circle sponsors uh in order to bring uh, enrichment and support to the special needs community of West Bloomfield, but the surrounding areas as well, all of Metro Detroit. And we also have schools that come in from all over Southeast Michigan. So we actually serve over 3000 children in the area with our um, Weinberg village in the basement of our friendship circle where kids can learn all kinds of life skills. Uh, we have on-site children's programs. We have our vocational program with Dakota Bakery and Soul Cafe. Mm -hmm. And we also have our artistic enrichment program at Soul Studio. Okay, wow, yeah, see, and, and it, it just, just talks about how, you know, like we said, the direct impact that's being made from the turnout, from, from everyone giving, donating, and things of that nature. But with us right here live on the Splash, executive assistant to the director for the Friendship Circle, talking about the uh, Walk for Friendship uh, event that happened over the weekend. We have Julie Newcomb talking about overall the impact uh, that the event has had and overall how important support from the community is. Now, can you just talk about some of the responses that you may have received from the sponsors, the participants, and just people in general? It's been very, very positive. Everybody loved coming together. It was a beautiful day, which helps immensely. Uh, yep. So nobody got too hot. Hopefully it was a nice, cool, 
Um, mm -hmm. Sunny, breezy day, so that was lovely. Um, we had wonderful responses to the food. And we had Nissim Black, who is a uh, Orthodox Jewish Israeli American rapper who came and performed for us. And we had a wonderful okay. time uh, dancing and listening to him. Nice, nice. So, uh, and we love to see that. We love that we had great response from people. That just overall just makes it feel like we are looking forward to more of these in the future. With that being said, can you just talk about the next event coming up from uh, uh, the Friendship Circle or the next Walk for Friendship? Anything that you all have going on we need uh, community support for? Well, we're very excited about the 2000, 2025 Walk for Friendship. It's going to be the 20th year of our walk. So we are going to have a wonderful celebration that hopefully brings in even more people from the community and beyond uh, to our site. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again for your time and thank you for being here. Much success. And we're hoping that we can still reach that goal. Once again, tell people how they can help donate if they are still looking to help us reach that goal of one million. Yes, please go to walkforfriendship.com. That's walk the number four mm -hmm. friendship.com. Thank you very much for supporting Friendship Circle of Michigan. Absolutely. Thank you again so much again for your time. Julie Newcomb, Executive Assistant to the Director for Friendship Circle. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me on. Yes, yeah. We're so glad that it was a great turnout in the community, that the community actually showed up and that they're still getting donors and sponsors to actually help and kind of get that, uh, to help reach that goal of $1 million. So great turnout from the community right there, Jake. Excited to hear about that. Absolutely. Every little bit helps the Friendship Circle reach their goal. It's great to see so much of the community come out this past weekend to support the Friendship Circle, to support those kids. Yeah. It's it's always amazing to see Kevin, and it it really it really warms my heart as well. No, no, great great work going on there, and we love to see that, and we love to see local organizations doing things that just affects and impacts the community in general. Speaking of that, the youth getting them the kids up and moving, especially at a young age. Tiny Tyke Soccer will be kicking off Wednesday, September fourth, at Marsh Bank Park, and it's an exciting program that's going to be teaching some soccer skills to some of the community's youngest athletes. We recently discussed some more details with coordinator for Challenger Sports' Michigan Tiny Tykes program, Dylan Burks. And Dylan, thank you for uh, 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 for the information as we uh, continue to get uh, talk about his interview right here. Like it's the introduction to soccer. It's like the first touches that these kids have of our soccer ball, like we make it very um, fundamental movement based. So it's like, you know, we do a lot of like the running stuff and the jumping and it's like gaining your movements while using your, your soccer ball. And it's like, where you'll start with your like first foot skills on your soccer ball. And it's very like your soccer ball is yours for your session. Um, so it's just like a good way okay. to have people like have kids introduced into the sport of soccer. Nice, nice. So, okay, so it's giving them all the opportunity instead of, like, sharing the ball. I mean, I'm pretty sure there'll be moments of that, but they all get their own individual ball to kind of work on their skills individually, one-on-one -on -one style. I like that. So how are we doing that, especially with the youth, in a fun and engaging way? <clears throat> yeah, so every um, every session in our curriculum has a story base to it. So whether we have, like, superheroes or... We have dragons, we have down at the farms. So we have like four or five activities per session and they're all based around this like one story and they're all parts of the story. So because we are mm. telling the story, it's a good way to, you know, keep them actually engaged in it um, and they enjoy getting involved in the story and playing out like different parts of the story throughout the session. Man, that's a, that's very interesting. Okay, and that's creative too. I like that because, like we said, keeps their attention also. So we're we're dealing with the youth right here in West Bloomfield. So can you share any of the benefits that you personally feel West Bloomfield kids and their families can expect from participating in Tiny Tox Tiny Tykes Soccer Program? Excuse me. Absolutely. So I think it's a good on the child side. I think it's a good way to be introduced to potentially a new sport. Um, we have a lot of right. like people who sign up like multiple years in a row, um, and then on the like back of that, we run other programs. So like this year, um, we ran three summer camps 
in West Bloomfield as well. So they sort of like bounce off okay. each other, you know, once you've done tiny tights for a few years, then you might want to take the next step up into um, our summer camps and then like find a sport that you want to, you know, carry on playing it into the future. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. And I want to kind of break down how you said some of them will be here for a few years. So that kind of just talks about their development. But with us right here live on the splash, talking about the Tiny Tykes soccer program, we have the coordinator for Challenger Sports' Michigan's Tiny Tykes program, Dylan Burks being right here, answering some of the questions, including just talking about your specific look on it as a coach, I guess I should say. How do you adapt your coaching techniques to suit the different developmental stages and the young participants in the program? So, me personally, my biggest thing, especially in Tiny Sites, is all about, like, your energy and being, like, loud and energetic and engaging with them. Um, like, that takes, like, that's first, and then like all the soccer stuff is second. Because if you can't have the energy to have them engaged in the session, then they're not gonna like uh -huh. do it, no matter what it is. So you keep it like, like the story we discussed before. Like you try and mention the story like as much as you can, and you keep the story going. Um, and then even as well, like interacting with the parents is a really good one because they're more likely to listen to parents than you. So if you want to get the parents involved sometimes and stuff like that as well, like that I've also found that's like massively helpful into keeping them into the session nice nice and that's what it's all about getting everybody involved too the parents as well and and with that being said can we speak on that like what role do you feel like west bloomfield the, the greater west bloomfield community plays and families in general play in supporting the tiny tykes program um, I mean, if you've attended it before and, you know, you think it's good, you want to sign up again, then, like, refer somebody that you know who, you know, you think their child might be interested in it. Um, because if we keep growing the program, then there's no reason why we don't continuously run it, like, year on year. Um, like, we run it in the spring, we run it in the fall, and then we even now run Tiny Tags as part of our summer camp as well. So if, you know, if, you, right. if you've done it before and you like it, just keep putting the word out there and then we can keep growing the growing the program hopefully no, no, I get that. That's the way that we can support on and off the field, with that being said. Keep spreading the word. Keep signing up if we are interested. So, and I'm glad you were able to say it yourself. Dylan, we do appreciate your time. Any additional information that we should know about the program, anyone listening that wanted to be a part of it, how can they find out more? Absolutely. So we this year we are running from September 4th through till October 16th um, at the location that you guys mentioned before. Uh, anybody who is interested in signing up and hasn't already, um, reach out to Mike Hodgkins. Um, he is the guy from the Parks and Rec, and he like coordinates our whole program. Um, and then we send one of our trainers in to coach the coach the program. So if anyone's interested, um, reach out to him and he can give you the next steps. Perfect. Thank you again. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your enthusiasm as you actually Absolutely. help us um, uh, encourage people to uh, sign up and do a little bit more with soccer also. We appreciate you again. Thank you so much. Once again, the coordinator for Challenger Sports is Michigan's Tiny Tyke Soccer Program, Dylan Burks. We appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. Yeah, have a good one. Another great program to kind of get our kids up at them and active locally in the community. Tiny tight soccer program for our youth right here in the greater West Bloomfield area. Kicking off Wednesday, September 4th. Another great resource for our local community, uh, uh, Jake, as we continue just to keep everyone updated about things going on. We love to kind of in introduce soccer uh, as, as a sport for our youth. Absolutely. It's, it's another great way to help keeping the kids of the community very active, very healthy. It's, it's little things like this that make a big mm -hmm. difference, especially starting at such a young age like Tiny Tykes is doing. I think that this is going to provide more than just a lot of fun for these kids, more than just a lot of fun playing soccer. It's going to help them develop mentally, and it's going to I, – I, I just see nothing but benefits with this, Kevin. It, it's a great thing.
yeah no absolutely man we love to talk about that and celebrate that and speaking of celebration there's actually a celebration going on locally with a local church the orchard lake community church presbyterian celebrating 150 years the 150th anniversary uh, anniversary celebration continues that'll be friday september 13th with a a, a youth concert also and one of the djs actually the DJ that will be DJing and providing the music and the vibes for that event. Joining us right here live on the splash to talk about everything from his perspective, local resident international DJ, Jared Code, AKA DJ Code. Thank you for being here. And let's just talk about what excites you the most about performing at this historic anniversary event. And number one, it's truly an honor to be even booked for an event like this. Um, a lot of a lot of churches of this kind don't book DJs, if you will. <laughs> mm, yeah. You know, so um, so it's so it's so good. I'm really really excited to just see kids come together, see teens come together, and uh, really just be able to worship the Lord in kind of a different way. Um, so yeah, very very excited about that. That's what's up. And just like we just talked about too, the concert that you'll be at is specifically aimed at youth in grades six to 12, encouraging them to bring friends and energy to this event. With that being said, if I'm not mistaken, your genre focuses on like Christian hip hop, or, or you can elaborate that on, on a little bit more, but how do you blend faith and music in a way that it resonates with the younger audience? Ooh, that's good. Um, so, so my motto has always been like, uh, God made hearts and hearts have beats. And so, you know, mm. that we can really come in and just do a different style of worship. Worship takes a lot of different forms and very, very excited just to be able to like minister in this way. I get to DJ for a lot of amazing, amazing people like Grammy nominated artists that are in the Christian, um, the CHH world, Christian hip hop world. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, just being able to bring some younger artists to um, out to this event just to see them blossom and different things. I've got a couple local Detroit guys coming out um, and then and, uh, a guy named Booker Newton uh, coming out from Lansing also. So, nice. Yeah. Oh, man, that's what's up. With us right here live on The Splash is talking about an upcoming event he'll be a part of. Jared Cole, also known as DJ Cole, who will be performing Friday, September 13th at the Orchard Lake Community Church for the 150th anniversary also. If I'm not mistaken, you are an internationally traveled DJ. So how does your global experience influence your music and performances in local communities like Orchard Lake? Yeah, you know, I started in the, like, the local community. I remember, like, at the beginning of my career, like, going into churches and uh, literally, like, knocking on the door, like, on a Sunday and talking to the youth pastor mm -hmm. and asking if I could do a show. And, you know, God has been able to open the door for me to actually go overseas. Um, we did Pakistan a couple years ago, and Ooh. that was, like, 150,000 people. Wow. And I love to come back home. Like, that is one of my favorite things to do is, like, you know, they say home is where the heart is, and that's just so true, so true. And um, I love to come home and actually be able to serve the community I'm in because, you know, uh, the, the word says, you know, love thy neighbor. So I'm here to do that. I'm very, very excited to actually be able to be in uh, kind of my home state. So. Yeah, and actually live that out, too. Love thy neighbor. I love that you, you actually, yeah, I love that, man. Great, great work, everything that you're doing, too. What can the youth expect from this concert that they will be attending with you? It's gonna be loud. It's gonna be loud. Um, it's, it's gonna be. It's gonna be an amazing time. Uh, Orchard Lake has a, a amazing facility that they're letting us use. We're actually trailering in a lot of equipment. It's going to be a ton of fun. It's gonna be an experience to never forget. Uh, a thing I tell my guys all the time is I say, well, this could be some kid's first concert, so we perform the same everywhere we go. Like, it's just gonna be an amazing time. We're very, very excited to be able to bring that to the area, so. How does how does how does it feel knowing that you are actually part of a celebration like this? 150 years of a church being planted right here in this community. How does that kind of that feeling take place and uh, what we're expecting from your performance? Yeah, it feels amazing. Um, it's it's amazing to see that faith can stand the test of time, you know, um, and. I, I don't know. It's just, it's such an amazing feeling. Like, I can't even explain, uh, even like the pastor was telling me the story of like how people used to come over from one of the islands in the area mm. um, and actually like be able to come to church. And I, the fact that I get to be a part of the history of this church is so amazing. It, it doesn't happen very often. So, 
Yes, yes. And I know it has to be a great feeling, like you said, coming back to, to your hometown, your home area, and serving the people, doing great things, and celebrating 150 years with a local church also. I know it has to feel great. Any additional information that you want to tell the community about yourself, about your performance, and or why they should come out? Well, I guess first and foremost, and I'll keep it short, but... Um... I, I want to just promo the guys that are coming. We've got Damari and Tristan, local guys from Detroit. Booker Newton is a good friend of mine. He's coming out with an EP later on this year, so I'll, I'll, we can talk about that on another segment. <laughs> but, uh, but just very, very excited to have these guys. Um, I want to be able to show these guys um, that they're able to do this full-time. Like, I get to do this full-time. Mm. None of these guys that are coming get to do this full-time. So okay. very, very excited to show them that. And then also be able to show kids in the community that you can do this and actually sustain a career um, in doing faith-based music. And not yeah. only that, but just music in general. And it can be a ton of fun. So, I, yeah, I it's going to be amazing. That. I love that message. I love that message. There we go right there, man. And we appreciate your time. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for explaining that. And good luck as you go out there Friday, September 13th. Once again, joining us, Jared Cole, also known as DJ Cole, will be out Thank there you. at Orchard Lake Community Church. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Once again, a lot going on in the community for us to talk about. September 13th, Orchard Lake Presbyterian Community Church celebrating 150 years. Happy to talk about it on the show, Jay, to keep our audience updated. And y'all can watch, you can watch that again on our website, civiccentertv.com. Click on the On Demand tab. But right now, we are live, local, social. It's the Splash Live on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM.